last week we heard from Dominic Doan. Were you guys here for that? Yes. Dominic is amazing. He's over in Raleigh. He unfolded the end of Mark 11 and the beginning of Mark 12 for us, which uh, it was all about Jesus' authority being challenged. Uh, and Jesus is owning his challengers. They have nothing on him. Um, so the story we're at today, it continues that progression of challenges to Jesus' authority. Actually, the whole book of Mark is one giant treatise for the authority of God in Christ. Uh, every story ramps up to people being amazed by something Jesus said or did, and it just shows how Jesus has authority over people groups, over demonic powers, over elements, winds, waves, over the religious system of Israel. Jesus is the final say. Uh, so the plan today is to read the next section, Mark 12, verse 13 through 17, unpack it verse by verse, and then talk about what Jesus is or and isn't saying in this incredibly controversial for Jesus' day story. Uh, so let's read. I got my Bible here, actually. It's the NIV from, from here at church. I, this, I don't usually, I need to get an NIV of my own, but you guys read NIV, so I grabbed one from the church. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees, Mark 12, 13, and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Love it. Get him, Jesus. So cool. The key issues here again are authority and allegiance. And whoever has the authority can demand the allegiance. So if there, is an, if there is an ultimate authority, which we believe God has revealed in Christ to us, well then that ultimate authority demands our ultimate allegiance. Kind of just let the cat out of the bag just then. Um, for Jesus, Palm Sunday just happened. Today is Palm Sunday in the church calendar. But for Jesus, Palm Sunday just happened. And right after he enters the city on a donkey triumphantly, he walks into the temple. And because as the prophet said, the zeal for my house has eaten me up, he overturns tables and messes with everybody's system that they had going. He, he responds very aggressively to the den of thieves, quote unquote. So that was Palm Sunday. Now it's a new day and Jesus is back in the temple. The Pharisees didn't get him the first time because they were afraid of the people, didn't know how to respond. But now they're ready with guns loaded. Um, so everyone's watching. It's probably a packed house since Passover. It's kind of like their Christmas. Everyone comes back to town. Passover, it's like the biggest travel day to the temple of the year. It's only a few days away. Super intense setting. Everybody's kind of packed in watching this interaction. So let's read verse 13. We're going to walk through this. This is, this is fun. Later, it says, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. Now, verse 13 begins with the word later, but in the original Greek, later is not there. So it's almost like, and then this happened, it's immediate. The pacing is fast. Mark's pacing is relentless here. So the idea is that Jesus' authority is being challenged over and over, like waves just coming in relentlessly. So Jesus' challengers, now look at who they are, the Pharisees and the Herodians. We think that these two groups didn't really talk to each other very often. Uh, Pharisees were devout for Jewish, uh, Jewish law and the Torah, and the Herodians were in bed with Caesar. They were uh, all about, they were kind of like the Hellenistic side. They were uh, colluding with the empire that was oppressing the Israelite system. So basically it'd be like if the conservative Tea Party and like uh, the proponents of Obamacare got together and had pizza or something together. Like that doesn't happen. They don't just hang out. Um, but, but they're hanging out here because they're unified by a common enemy. They're both both our systems are massively threatened by this 33-year-old Jewish troublemaker from Nazareth. Um, so they devise a genius scam, a plan, a scheme to trap Jesus. They try to trick him. Their question's brilliant, actually, because it's loaded. And it addresses a hot-button issue. Might be the hot-button kind of political authority issue of Jesus' generation. 
Um, to understand the crazy tension, though, like, there's nothing quite like this for us. We have to go back in time for a second. So will you indulge a little history? Is that okay? You good? All right. I, I like history. Some people don't, so I have to disclaim. Here we go. I think most would agree taxes are unpleasant. And they happen to be only two days away. So no procrastination. Time for procrastination is almost over. But for Jewish people in the first century, taxes were more than just a blow to the wallet, okay? Uh, the tax referred to here was a poll tax that was instituted by Caesar, the oppressor. So in addition to local taxes, temple taxes, and for Galileans in the north, Herod's taxes, in addition to those taxes, they would pay a poll tax, which was one day's wage, to Caesar. So all the known world would pay this, this tribute coin that symbolized one day's wage in their culture. Um, <clears throat> You see, the Jews, it wasn't just the price of the coin, it was what the coin represented. Uh, they were burdened by a horrible paradox. You see, they were in the land, the land God promised them, chosen to live in the land, but Rome was in the house. Rome was over the house. Rome had the household. Uh, so it's like they're in their home, but not enjoying the fruit of freedom in their home. It's like they were losing on their home court. And uh, that just added uh, insult to injury. Um, so for hundreds of years, since the Babylonian invasion, Israel had been ruled by others. And here in Mark 12, it's just Rome, and it's just another tax. Uh, but what was worse than that <clears throat> about this tax is that the Torah specifically uh, forbid graven images, right? You have no graven, Im graven images in the Ten Commandments. Ancient Jews debated over with whether this command included graven images of plants and animals. Like, they actually had that debate. Like, are plants and animals okay? Is it sin to make a plant out of a rock? Um, but definitely, we can't make a human image out of anything. That was out for their culture. That was considered idolatrous, yet staring back at them from their very coin was a graven image of their oppressor, nonetheless, the one man that was behind all of their suffering. And so they had this coin and it was resented by the Pharisees. There it is. It was resented by the Pharisees and, he, and there, was a, there was a group called the Zealots that wouldn't even touch it. They wouldn't even pay the tax with it. Whatever taxes they paid were paid with Israel, Israelite coins, national like shekels or whatever. Um, so there it is. Uh, and even worse, check it out. There's his face, pretty cool. I think it looks cool. Actually, I've held one of these before. Uh, I went to Israel a couple years back and you can go to like these archeological stores that are certified by the state of Israel to be legit. And you can pay 80 bucks for one of those. <laughs> so, so you spend 80 bucks and you have this 2000 year old coin from the time of Jesus. Um, Cause they're just swimming in them. They just find them in hills all over the place there. Um, but, but, but they won't look like that for 80 bucks. Uh, like if you want it, if you want it like legible, or it looks awesome like that, it's like 800 bucks, 1200 bucks. But, um, but around Caesar's head, it says, Caesar, son of the divine. So for worshipers of Yahweh, you can see where the rub would be. Uh, Caesar is claiming divinity. And the other side, you have Pontiff Maxim, or get this, uh, uh, literally, high priest. So, so, so their oppressor with a graven image masquerading on a tax imposed by a, a tyrannical regime claiming to be divine and a high priest. The Romans probably weren't trying to offend the Jews, but if they were trying, they couldn't have done a better job with this thing. Um, so you can see the tension here. This was, this was right at the heart of who they were as God's people. It, it just came right against it. So the tax was a bad thing, but there's another element going on here that we need to incorporate. It's the fact that everyone expected the Messiah, the one who would overthrow the tyrant, everyone expected the Messiah to be a political leader and like a, a revolutionary war hero. That was just what they expected. You ever wondered why Jesus always said, uh, he would always do a miracle and then it'd be awesome and then he'd make someone healed or see and for the first time in their life and he'd be like, shh, but don't tell anyone. It's like, what, why not? That's crazy. <laughs> like, I, would, don't, I never got, got that. It's like, I just did this amazing thing, but don't tell anyone. Why was Jesus so secretive about his identity as the Messiah? Well, simply put, he didn't, didn't want to die early. <laughs> he didn't want to die before his time. See, everyone expected the Messiah, even the Jewish leaders expected the Messiah to be a great political revolutionary war hero. 
the one who would overthrow Rome and Israel would receive its proper seat. Um, after all, this was what the Old Testament said. Like, this is what the prophesies, the prophecies said um, in Daniel 2.44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It'll crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. That's, that's what the Pharisees banked on. The Pharisees read their Bibles, so they were banking on this to happen. You can't really guilt them uh, for having this idea. The Pharisees rightfully placed their hope in the prophecies about the Messiah. And the truth is Jesus was going to overthrow evil and restore the kingdom. Only it would be through self-sacrificial love and not violent coercion. But the powers that be couldn't understand that. So simply put, the element here, this is the important piece. The moment Jesus comes right out and as Israel's true king and Messiah, that moment the leaders of Israel have perfectly legal grounds for a Roman Empire-sponsored execution of Jesus that day. So... Um, so you see the tension. You've got A, on one side, this coin that's idolatrous and the controversy of the Roman taxation, and B, the expectation of the Messiah who would deliver them from that oppression was that of a war hero, a conquering, you know, like, like all the revolutionaries were in Jesus' day. So this is the dramatic and super tense backdrop for this story. Um, so let's continue with that in mind. Verse 14. They came to him and said, verse 14, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? So they approached Jesus with a bunch of compliments. Um, this is the bait to lure him into the trap. So it could be empty flattery, in which case it would be ironic because it's true. <laughs> true statements. Jesus isn't swayed by others. He is a man of integrity, and he does preach the truth. So if it's empty flattery on the part of the Pharisees, it's ironic for them because it's true. Um, but if it's not empty flattery, if they're actually thinking Jesus is this way, then the reason they're, think the reason they're coming at him, uh, this could be their honest opinion, uh, and, and then they'll get him to say what he really thinks in front of all these people, and then he'll be busted when Rome drags him off to be crucified that afternoon. So it's super baited and brilliant, their trap. Uh, if Jesus says, yes, it's right to pay the imperial, imperial tax, then his people will turn against him because they hate the imperial tax and everything it represents. Uh, on the other hand, if Jesus says, no, it's not right to pay the tax, if it's just a yes or no answer, it's dangerous. Because if he says no, his opponents are given all they need to bust him. So the crowds are pressing in, silence falls. What will Jesus say? What will he say? Uh, how will he get out of this one? It's looking really good for Jesus' challengers at this point. And into this crucial moment of tension, Jesus speaks. Verse 15. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? And imagine the crowd, and Jesus is like, why are you trying to trap me? Like, really loud for everyone to hear. I love that. The Pharisees were always trying to save face. They feared the people. So if Jesus exposed their motive before he bothers answering, the people already kind of tuned in to the fact that the Pharisees are shady. So that's brilliant on Jesus' part. And then Jesus says, bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And then verse 16, check it out. And they brought the coin and he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? As if he didn't know. Like that's the most famous human Caesar. And Jesus holds up the most famous human being's face who inspired so much pain for their people. He's like, who's that? And they're like, well, that's, who, and what does it say? Well, who is this guy? Almost as if like it's inconsequential to me. Like all this freaking out over this, what is this? And they say, well, it's Caesar's. It's Caesar's inscription, it's Caesar's face. And Jesus says, Give back to Caesar what's Caesar's. And to God what's God's. With the coin raised for all to see the symbol of evil, everything that was evil, Jesus calls their attention to the image. This human image, this graven image, blasphemous and offensive. And he basically says, since the coin's idolatrous, throw it back where it came from. Give it back. Don't freak out. Give back to Caesar what's his. Send the filthy stuff back. He can have it for all I care. Why would we want this idolatrous piece of metal anyway? 
My kingdom doesn't work this way. It doesn't hinge on this stuff. Money, popular, partisan, politics, like, neither. Just engage, give it, whatever. Give it back. Caesar can have his poll tax for all I care. And this ingenious response from Jesus doesn't end there. He says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give God what is God's. The coin bears Caesar's image, so Caesar can have it. But who bears God's image? We do. In fact, the first thing spoken of human beings in all of scripture is Genesis 126. Let us make mankind in our image. Caesar gets his blasphemous coin back, and what does God get? He gets us. He gets all of us. This is like the capstone moment for this story. Now, it'd be pretty safe and easy to land the plane here, I think. You know, pay your taxes on Tuesday and uh, give God your heart today at church, whatever. And let's pray, you know? Like, easy. That would be safe and it'd probably be helpful, but I'm worried that the implications of Jesus' words here are a little bit more farther reaching. And uh, I'm worried that they might actually be messing with our deeply held allegiances. He's wanting to reorient our loyalties here, everyone in the room. Jesus is actually doing a lot here, okay? Three things worth pointing out. And, and this might come out of left field at first, but follow. Jesus here is rejecting the way of a guy named Judas, the Galilean, and his followers, the Zealots. When Jesus was a little boy, this tribute tax was instituted by Caesar in AD 6. And what happened was revolt, led by this guy named Judas from Galilee. We know this to be true from Josephus the historian, and he's mentioned in Acts by a guy named Gamaliel. Remember Gamaliel? He was one of the Sanhedrin. And they're talking about Christians, and they're like, what is this Christian thing? What's going on? Who is this? Why is this movement? Is it going to, let's squash the movement. And Gamaliel goes, hey, if, Christ, if the Christian way is of Jesus, I mean, if he says, if the Christian way is of God, then who can stop it? But if it's not of God, then it'll be like this Judas guy who was butchered by the Romans for revolting. So Jesus is rejecting this guy named Judas. Uh, so for Jewish nationalists, listen, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, it means Jesus rejects violent response as a means to power. This was a big deal. Jesus knew that violent revolution changes the rulers, but not the rules. So he's demonstrating a better way, the way of living peaceably and honorably toward authority, even authority as oppressive as Caesar. Jesus is saying to make peace and to even live in a way that blesses the oppressor. Jesus offers a whole new way of confronting evil, this time with bold love, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, forgiving enemies and praying for them, and giving one's life for others, disadvantaging yourself for the sake of the community. This is the way of Jesus. So Jesus rejects Judas the Galilean and his ways of zealous, zealotry. Um, zealous, zealotry. <laughs> Devil. That was smooth. Jesus also rejects the collaborative way. Listen, he also re rejects the collaborative way of the Herodians. The Herodians, remember, they're in bed with the empire. They were collaborating with the oppressor. They were given over to Rome. And for them, Jesus says, render to God the things that are God's. Detach from all unholy alliances and place yourself completely under the rule of God. And there's a third party Jesus challenges. He challenges the Pharisees. He calls the Pharisees to be true to Torah, be true to their own scriptures, and have a concern for biblical justice. A big one for Pharisees, uh, because they love the Bible, was the beginning of the prophets, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter one. But ironically, they weren't living by Isaiah's cry. Isaiah one says, uh, it talks about spreading your hands out in prayer, but your hands are full of blood. It talks about seeking justice and defending the oppressed, siding with the orphan, speaking for the widow. These are God's things. So when Jesus says, render to God the things that are God's, it's the things that the Pharisees were claiming to teach to do, but weren't actually doing at all. The Pharisees, you guys, they were like the good guys. They were really good. They were like national heroes. Um, but in the words of Tim Keller about Pharisees, Pharisees repent of their wrongdoings. They just don't repent of their reasons for their right doings, which are just as bad. 
Their motives were all askew. And so Jesus is doing a lot here, and they're all thinking, who is this guy? And that's the question, guys. That's the question for us. Who is this guy? And what does that mean for us? Well, let's talk about what this doesn't mean, something I would like to affectionately refer to as the myth of a dual citizenship. The myth of a dual citizenship. You see, okay, guys, what has often happened with this text, and it's understandable given our culture and our cultural context, what has often happened in this text is that it has been used to enforce a sacred, secular divide. It's the Gnostic mindset that our lives happen in separate parts. The spiritual part over here, the work part over here, the political part over here, the entertainment, and so on, right? So in your spiritual part, it requires a certain way of thinking and behaving, and we live that out. And then we have our work part requires a certain way of thinking and behaving, and our social part, and our political part, all different ways, and so on. So historically, our Western mindset has done an especially good job of bifurcating, separating the political and the spiritual into two distinctly different parts. Some of that can be helpful, obviously, for some reasons, but a lot of that is really, really bad, especially bad for the effectiveness of Christian mission in the world. Um, So, as Westerners, it's really easy to read this passage in Mark and think, okay, Jesus is saying, pay your taxes over here and make sure God always has my whole heart over here. Um, But that actually isn't what Jesus is saying. It's not limited to that. One of the many problems with this line of thinking is that it it creates for us this myth of dual citizenship. It's, we, it's the idea that we have a citizenship in heaven and another, in our case, in America. While this is obviously true in a sense, we obviously are citizens of both on a, in a sense, the massive problem arises when our competing allegiances do not allow Christ to inform all of life. We can't have those competing allegiances. And that's what Jesus means when he says, give to God what's God's. Jesus says, pledge allegiance to me. Let me inform all of life, not parts, not even parts of life, not even all parts of life, but think of all of life. So what Jesus is doing here, he's messing with everyone's allegiances. So let's talk about you and me for a minute. If we are going to allow Jesus to inform all of life, we're going to have to check all of our allegiances at his feet, whether it's work, political, financial, our social interactions, entertainment, recreational, whatever. Like these, you squash them all together in one big messy sphere called just life. See it as one whole beautiful thing and then take it and revisit the gospels with your life in your hands. Revisit the gospels and ask the question, does my work ethic look like Jesus? Do my politics sound like Jesus? Do my finances align with how Jesus talks about money? Because he has a ton to say about it. Do my social interactions go down the way Jesus does in the text, in the dialogue, in the narrative? See this story, render to Caesar what Caesar's and to God what's God's? It shows us that Jesus is not some apolitical guru with his head in the clouds sipping mint tea and chanting. Jesus is not this, this distanced, detached, irrelevant for some, but really good for th- therapy, you know? That's not Jesus. This story shows us that Jesus has his politics He is subversively political. It's just that Jesus' politics transcend the popular partisan power playing of our day. Um, He doesn't avoid the political issues of his day at all. He just speaks to them in such a way that we're surprised, (laughs) confused, and even often offended. Um, So now, listen, and this is a really, I hope I don't, I hope I'm not unmisheard or anything. This is a really important part. What I'm about to say here, let me be super clear. Beneath Jesus' kingship as his subjects, we are called to submit to certain people and certain institutions, okay? Let me not be heard as saying otherwise. We are citizens to the governing authorities, according to Romans 13. We're children to parents, Ephesians 6, so on and so on. But it isn't because... It isn't because they have ultimate authority over us. It isn't because they're right or good. Jesus is our one true authority, and we submit to the people and institutions that he's placed in our lives 
because he's placed them in our lives and he tells us to do so. It comes from him. It's under his authority that we submit, not because of theirs. Understand? That is the ancient patristic, meaning of the church fathers, view towards civil authority, even when the civil authority was killing the church fathers. The point of the story is, here's the point, we owe Caesar something, but not everything, and we who bear God's image and are inscribed with Jesus' name owe God everything. That is massively important, those distinctions there. And God, the God we owe everything to, listen, the God we owe everything to is fully and finally revealed in Jesus. So Jesus is our ultimate authority and he gets our ultimate allegiance. Now, my guess is we all have honored allegiances that are distinct from our allegiance to Jesus. So let me suggest a new and greater allegiance for all of us. See, most of us, if we're honest, if we're honest, even those of us that are diehard, super freak, Jesus freak guys, you know, like we love him and we're super into him and we give him everything, whatever. Most of us still, the best of us, don't think some of Jesus' teachings are all that practical, at least not all the time. Because ultimately our one true authority may require us to disobey or defy the people and the institutions to which we're called to submit. Meaning this, if the way of Jesus is ever in opposition to the state, the way of your parents, your boss, if Jesus' way is, in, is flowing completely opposite to the way of authority that is present other than Jesus in your life, then the way of Jesus must win out every time. Even if it means losing a raise or losing a job, losing a social media persona, losing a friend, Losing your girlfriend, boyfriend, even if it means being ostracized or ridiculed or persecuted by your community. Even if it means legal action against you. Imprisonment. And historically, even death. And sure, we're sitting here in Portland with, with coffee in our hands and comfy seats and stuff, and we know in our heads that that kind of persecution and suffering is going on elsewhere in the world, but not. Not here, not with us. We're comfortable, uh, right? It's much easier to bend and break the truth to advance ourselves rather than to pay the costly fee of integrity. The way of Jesus, the fact is, even for us, the way of Jesus can strip away our comfort and get us into a lot of trouble. He never pretended that it wouldn't. In fact, the entire New Testament it reads like a manual on how to turn your entire life upside down with warning after warning after warning that it'll cost us everything. In the story today, Jesus seems to simultaneously amaze and alienate every sect represented in the court at the time. Uh, violent revolution? Nope, let them have their money. Doesn't matter. Oh, so loyalty and subservience to the system and to the empire? Nope, they can have their money. But God gets us. All of us. Caesar's image is on the coin, but not on us, Jesus says. America's Im image is on the dollar, but not on us. So for us in Portland, 2014, 2014, the question isn't necessarily who gets your taxes. And again, they're apparently due in a couple days. Um, not to be buzzkill. But <laughs> the question isn't necessarily who gets your taxes. The question is, who gets you? Who gets me? Who gets all of me, all of me? And remember, for us, there's no sacred secular divide. Who gets all of me? There's no sacred secular divide. For us, everything is spiritual. And by everything is spiritual, I don't mean everything is immaterial or mystical. I mean all of life is holistic. This is biblical. All of life is heavenly and earthly, material and immaterial, inseparably enmeshed by one creator God. We are integrated. In theology, this is called the doctrine of biblical holism. The scriptures teach us that God created humans, holistic beings. Let me put it this way. In ancient Israel, no one ever spoke in terms of a spiritual life. Like, How's your spiritual life? Like, you don't see that question in the scriptures. In fact, most likely if you ask Peter or Paul or David, like, how's your, how's your spiritual life? What's going on in your spiritual walk? David and Peter, Paul, they'd be like, uh, what? Like, are my crops blessed with rain? Like, is my family healthy? Am I studying Torah? 
is the exile over? Like, is God still on the throne of heaven and the earth is still God's footstool and am I still in his household forever? What are you asking? Well, everything is spiritual. Like, what am I spiritual? For the Bible, everything is spiritual. It's this giant, integrated, holistic, heaven and earth enmeshment. And God is overall, we're called to steward it, okay? So we give to God what is God's. We give to God what is God's. When it comes to our worldview, the filter by which we see things and everything, our authority and our king, there's only Jesus, it's Jesus. If anyone, if anyone else gets obedience and submission, it's only because Jesus, our true king, says so. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's and give to God what's God's. Us, everything. We may not have allegiance tied up in state. I mean, we're, here, we're in Portland. This, folks are slightly less nationalistic than say like deep south, you know? It's just not as much of a thing. The culture is bent a little bit differently here. What's more common than extreme nationalism here is a misplaced hope, I would say, in various national institutions. Uh, while it's true, listen, it, while it's true that less and less young people are like, you know, die hard for a certain political party around here, more and more young people are looking to government systems for their source of future welfare rather than stewarding today in light of tomorrow which is basically the same thing. Uh, misplaced allegiance is misplaced allegiance. So are you giving to God what is God's? The holistic, manifold, single sphere of life that is you. Are you giving that to God? Are you? Am I? Not just my time or money or my right behaviors, but me. The me that is me that God has made. All of me is, am I giving it to God? To follow Jesus means to accept where this journey leads. Following Jesus leads to a cross. The life of a disciple demands a lifestyle of self-denial and self-sacrifice that rejects our innate and cultural understandings of glory and comfort in favor of being like Jesus. And no, it isn't glamorous, it isn't glamorous to join with Jesus and say, not my will, but yours be done. Not to share leadership with Jesus, but to lay yourself down at his feet. In fact, this Christ-shaped posture flies in the face of virtually everything we're taught as Westerners about individualism and empowerment and our own rights. It's the whole owners versus stewards mentality from last week with Dom. He talked about the vineyard owners. They were given a vineyard. They were given a life full of blessings and fruit and incredible well-being. And they went, I know this is God's, but actually I think we're the owners now. Let's kill God's son and take it over. And they transition in their minds from being stewards of God's many blessings to being owners of God's many blessings. And in effect, they threw logic to the wind and began the downward spiral of full-on secular humanism, really, because it was a godless creation that they were loving and worshiping. This is the air you and I breathe. It's coming at us from everywhere. Most of us have a built-in moral code that tells us we're deserving of a certain standard of living. We're entitled to a certain declaration of rights. We're entitled to keep what we earn. We're entitled to be kind to those who are kind to us. We're entitled to use violence against those who are violent. We're entitled to our own plans and our own hopes and our own dreams. We're a culture and a generation that can't fathom selflessness. We're a generation of selfies. <laughs> like 430 million selfies a day are uploaded to the internet, like that's insane. I just heard that stat two days ago. So 430 million selfies. I'm not saying that's bad, I'm just saying it says something. Like, it, it'll preach, you know? Like this says something about who, who us is, you know? Who we are. Um, so, I mean, this is the part where I was gonna insert my own personal story about problems with authority, but I realize I don't have any, so. Uh, just not at all true. I, I, when we first moved here, we were like four weeks in to move living here from San Diego, and uh, we I, we hadn't you know I hadn't I hadn't taken I was I hadn't taken my driver's test. Truth is I hadn't passed it. So m my wife did. We both took it together, and she's like yes. And I'm like, and I was on there was like 30 questions. I'm on question like 26, and I have like. Three left to get wrong before I, I'm totally gonna get these four. I'm not gonna get three out of the four. And it was like, wrong, wrong, wrong. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. And so my wife's like, yes. We, we have a competitive love. 
And so I'm driving with my California license and everything, and I'm just like trying to figure out the roads. And uh, I, <laughs> I was uh, just dropped my kid off at school. And you know like Fowl- Fowler Middle School pulling out on Walnut? That's an epically hectic left turn at 8.30 in the morning. So I'm pulling out, and, uh, and, and I, I, I turn left, and you got to kind of gun it because like traffic is relentless. And so I like gun it, and I get up to like, 30 miles an hour accidentally, and so I like start to cruise back, but it was too late. It's like, whoop, whoop. I get, get nailed, and then, uh, so I, uh, about to say I continue driving, but I didn't, I proceeded, proceeded to pull over, and man, I immediately felt that, that, that animosity towards this authority, you know? I feel that feeling like that is so, like I, like I'm brand new to the area, and so the guy, and so the guy pulls over, he's like, hey, uh, you know, faster going. I'm like, listen, let me explain. Like, <laughs> like I, I am from California. I just moved here like six weeks ago. Is that bad saying you're from California? <laughs> well, I'm a transplant trying to figure out the ropes. Brand new Portlander. How about that? So I'm like, I'm like, I'm like trying to figure out the rope. And and officer, your ungodly slow speed limits are horrible. No, I didn't say that even though they are 15 miles an hour on the five. Are you guys serious right now? Like, can't you like, can't you like sign a petition or something about that? So I'm like, okay, officer, I did tell him from, I just moved from California. I'm trying to figure out the ropes. Like in California, actually the speed, he's like, I'm sure California school zones are 20 also. And I'm like, actually not. Actually they're 25. And, and he's like, didn't even respond. I'm feeling like, just like I'm directing. I find myself, and here's the problem. I find myself like projecting all this like animosity toward this authority, you know? And uh, license, registration, insurance information, please. And I'm like, ah. And I ended up going to, you know, traffic. And you guys don't have traffic school. Like I asked him, do you have traffic school where you can get your point mark? He's like, traffic school. <laughs> <laughs> he just laughed. <laughs> I'm like, come on, I haven't had a ticket in years. Three years, like, well, in Oregon, you need five-year window. I'm like, ah, this is crazy. This is insane. And so it was a bad day. I'm still <laughs> bitter, but um, <laughs> I, I'm recovering, and I realize that that has to do with the problem of authority. I, even the, you know, the, the court situation afterwards, when I stood before the judge and tigered and begged for less, he's like, all right. He was nice. Um, but he still he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't let me off, but... It's a problem with authority. It's like all of us and me too. But listen, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus becomes the arbiter of every word and every response and every action that comes our way. So listen, there's hope. We have the Holy Spirit. Um, And myself, denied. My competing allegiances, put to death. The moment we pledge allegiance to Jesus and swear all of our fealties, all of our other loyalties beneath him, Holy Spirit helps us in that. Holy, the Holy Spirit becomes our arbiter. He becomes our helper and our comfort and our empowerment. Um, it absolutely defies our common sense sometimes, the way of Jesus in light of the world systems. It absolutely defies our common sense. But listen, if we don't allow Jesus to call into question our common sense convictions, then is it common sense or Jesus that is our Lord? So I think, in, as, as we wrap it up, I think we have two questions that we need to ask ourselves um, and to ask the Holy Spirit. First question, what allegiances, and it's on the board, board, screen, what allegiances do we need to reevaluate in light of our allegiance to Jesus? Just pray that in for a second. What allegiances do we need to reevaluate in light of our allegiance to Jesus? Is it allegiance to a person, girlfriend, coworker, spouse, child, allegiance to a human institution or business or social network or a model of some kind that you've implemented? Is it allegiance to a persona? Some kind of curated persona of yourself or a lifestyle or a career? What competes for your complete and undivided allegiance to Jesus? And the second question, truthfully, am I giving to God what is God's? Is God calling you to a more, is God calling me to a more complete worship? Not just weekend gatherings or singing songs or 10 minute Bible studies or missional communities. Not just going through the motions, but like 
you. Like all the, the you that is you and all that that entails and all of the interdependent parts. See our story, Mark 12, 13 through 17, it leads us somewhere. It's actually leading in the, somewhere in the text. It leads us to verse 28 through 31 where Jesus is asked the question. So it's gonna go on the screen. I'm gonna read the first part. We're all gonna read Jesus' answer together. All right? One of the teachers of the law, this is the same day of our story. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Can we all read it together out loud, one voice? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Can we all stand together? Can we stand in his presence? The king is in our midst. See, all the lesser gods and all the would-be masters, they fade away and all other allegiances and all of our dependencies, all the other ones have failed to offer any real hope for life or freedom. And here the true king of the world stands, Jesus. He stands not with coercive power over, but with subversive and self-sacrificial self power under. And he's the one we're following. He's the one we're modeling. He's the one we're disciples of, okay? We're his disciples, which means we follow in the footsteps of our rabbi. And our rabbi who actually made the world and became flesh, our rabbi demonstrated his own love for the world, not with terrifying power and this destruction of puny humans and look how awesome I am, and, but by washing feet, by taking off his garment and with a bowl and a rag in a position that he should not have been in, considered his status. And he ended up dying for his enemies, using his last breath to pray for their forgiveness. That's who we follow. That's what we're gonna to sing to. And we're gonna eat and drink at his table together. So let's check our hearts with him. Because uh, Jesus shows us what God is like. And uh, so let's, let's give God what's God's. Let's give him us. So let's sing together.